Oh my gosh, it's going to be a wild, loaded week of professional wrestling. Because now we not only get AW Dynamite and AW Dark, but we got a late night Dynamite special tomorrow night. Two nights of Dynamite. That is wild. I could not be more excited. Hello, everybody. Welcome once again to another fun episode of AEW Spark. My name is Noel Foster, and I'm just La Simple Man, and I'm just here to give you my overall coverage, reviews, reactions, and previews to all things All Elite Wrestling. With that being said, let's go ahead and briefly highlight Dark, because as always, I like to start AEW Spark by shedding some light on Dark. Uh, last week, we had, I believe, a 11-match showcase, which ironically we're going to have this week. Good grief. These AW Darks, they seem to be coming like 90 minutes close to a normal Monday Night Raw about commercial breaks. And I just enjoy them because they're a fun outlook for professional wrestling as well as some fun commentary. If you're not looking at the wrestling, you're listening to the commentary. As a t trio of Beta Scott, Excalibur, and Taz, they welcome us in AW Dark episode number 52. And I'm just going to give you the brief rundown of how the matches went through. So we first had the chief brandy officer with little Brand Brand. Good grief. With Dustin and Rose in her corner, uh, Brandy Rose, she took on straight from your mama's kitchen, Red Velvet. A uh, simple back and forth match, and right out of the get-go, apparently Red Velvet forgot to bring Brandy some sort of baked dessert, according to a tweet, and she got pump kick in the face. Strong, fun effort as the match progressed. We got Anna J coming out, walking, join the door order and watching from the entranceway, not really looking impressed at all while Brandy tried to intimidate her, literally ending this match with her old version of the sleeper uh, chokehold, but she didn't use basically her form and then she literally had to go all the way to her elbow. Did not seem as effective as me or as, you know, possibly damaging. And Anna Jay was under impressed well and so was I. But of course, Brandy Rose, uh, she got the win. That was pretty obvious to see. As she embraced her little Brandon action figure, that little figurine is gonna be her downfall. Uh, moving on from there, we got a tag match as the Butcher and the Blade with Eddie Kingston in their corner. They took on the uh, trio of, let's see here, Danny, Daniel Garcia and Kevin Blackwood. And literally, this was just a fun little moment of violence for this violent family. If you haven't seen the Friends thing that Amy did, please follow our Phoenix AEW for WrestleJoy. You are missing out. That is one of the funniest edits I've seen. Oh, man. Such a talented woman. Such a fun character, too. Good, positive person in the wrestling community. Anyway, Butcher and Blade, they delivered full depth. Quick, simple win. Match went about, I think, a little over five and a half minutes. Uh, following that, we had a good women's bout as Penelope Ford. She took on, with Skip Saving in her corner, Danny Jordan. And apparently, Kip Saving does not believe in the sacred will when it comes to a women's book of any sort. He, as the match was going, and uh, mostly Penelope Ford had this match in her uh, favor, but kudos to Jenny Joyner for her uh, effort. Went about uh, seven minutes. Uh, Kip Sabian grabbed the uh, burn book, as Jenny Joyner is the real mean girl professional wrestling, and literally found the page about Penelope Ford, showed Ford it, Ford got pissed, stuffed the page in Danny Joyner's mouth, and the writing was on the wall following that. Uh, basically, it was uh, super bad versus the real mean with uh, heel, um, what is it? What was it? Like a heel type presence. It, it was an interesting match. Commentary had some fun with both these uh, characters as well. The biggest thing that was talked about during throughout the show was apparently Beta Scott has has his pen. Why don't she give it back to him yet? Anyway, the beautiful, uh, effective fisherman suplex as high as her butt button could go. Not as high as usual though. I think she hurt her back off the. Uh, missile drop kick and how she landed. But either way, Penelope Ford, uh, she got the win and continued her momentum. Good effort, though, by Danny Jordan. Got some uh, good, uh, strong super kicks and licks in there. And again, she's very young in her career. I sense very much promise for her. And I hope AEW does sign her. Again, I really want AEW's women's division to evolve and expand. Uh, following that, we go into the machine, Brian Cage, taking on Megabyte Ronnie. And the only thing you need to figure out about this match is hot dog because apparently this guy as i learned from my good friend cindy please follow us cindy cs girl okay is a competitive eater and apparently he brought a fanny pack with an actual hot dog and a bun in it and i guess he used hot dog power to uh drop the elbow and a couple of times made taz literally sweat and give brian cage a little bit of run for his money but in the end brian cage was not having this he had enough of these little shenanigans and he literally drill clawed him for the win he also forced Justin Roberts to announce him as the FTW World Champion. Though it should be World Heavyweight Champion, according to Taz. Don't know why we keep acknowledging that title, but okay. 
Uh, moving on from there, Santana Ortiz took on the best hair duo in AEW, Griff Garrison and Brian Pillman Jr. And of course, they delivered again why they call themselves the best, the best, the best. As of course, we are preparing one day prior to their parking lot fight. And trust me, I got a lot to say on that. Uh, pretty good back and forth match. It went about uh, eight minutes. And uh, in the end, uh, Brian Pillman, he did get a hot tag, but he suffered at the hands of a powerbomb with a PK kickfall combination uh, in the ropes as Ortiz pinned Brian Pillman. A little different from the normal uh, street sweeper finish you would expect out of these two. And again, with their mixed fortunes and run for AEW, it's nice to see them actually garnering some momentum on dark. Not a bad match. And I still don't know who the hell Griff Garrison is. Don't ask me. And as far as Brian Pillman Jr. goes, he keeps impressing. And it's really showing off as apparently he will be involved on a special with Late Night Dynamite, and I'm looking uh, forward to that. Anyway, <clears throat> moving on from there, we go into hashtag willpower, and the latest signing to AEW, congratulations, Sydney could not be happier, uh, Will Hobbs. And Will Hobbs, he basically took on Jesse Sorensen in, I guess you can say a match? Because literally he came out, there was like one or two power moves, and then the Oklahoma Stampede finisher, Will Hobbs wins like that against the Mr. Never Die, Jesse Sorensen. I was expecting more from this personally, but okay. It was uh, interesting to say the least. And hey, he got out there. So there's that. <laughs> All right. Uh, moving on from there, we go into women's tag team action. That's Skylar Moore and Rache Chanel, two people that I know and are very into fashion. So I can see why they are a team. Uh, they took on the team of Ivalis and Diamete, Las Cicadas, of course, are AEW Women's Tag Team Cup champions. So let's pour in those medals. And uh, they basically showed why they are a very affected, aggressive, and dominant tag team. Ivalice with the rope through kick following a uh, backstabber by uh, <clears throat> Diamete. Nice tag team uh, combination after Skylar Moore got a hot tag after a station that was at the mercy of uh, Diamete in the early going when they isolated her in the corner. And in the end, La Cincas, they got the win. I really am surprised that Ivalice and Diamete are not signed to AEW. And I really do wonder if they uh, keep bringing this type of uh, infuego to the women's division. Could we be setting up a women's tag team division way in the future? Just saying. I mean, when you think about all the women that are involved on Dark and what is signed and what's not signed, what you see, what they're trying to do with women's division, I'm optimistic for it. But, hey, maybe they'll have another tag team cup, and that's when Ivalice and Diamete will be back in huge action again. has to defend the Mel's and that trophy. I wonder if that's going to be an annual thing. I wouldn't mind it. Anyway, <clears throat> moving on from there, we have the Dark Order. As... <clears throat> Colt Cabana, he took on QT Marshall with Ali, yay Ali, uh, in, in his corner. Uh, basically, both these men really need a win here as the Nightmare family tries to continue to go up against the Dark Order in the name of their fallen leader, Cody. Of course, the Natural Nightmare is coming off a huge win that even tired from all out, as Dustin did challenge for the TNT title last week on Dynamite, or two weeks ago, excuse me, what an amazing match that was too. But of course, he fell to Mr. Broy Lee and the Dark Order. As the Dark Order took out QT Marshall as well, both men were laid out in the middle of the ring. So of course, there's a little bit of redemption, but also it was huge redemption for Colt Cabana, who was really on thin ice, and the only person that seems to be still standing behind him is Evil Luna. And it's the Dark Order all watched on, including Anna Jay. Uh, basically, the Dark Order was telling Colt Cabana what to do at times. He was reluctant to do it. And again, that almost played to him losing in this match. It's Ali rooted on QT Marshall. And following this, we had multiple members of the Dark Order, including uh, three and four. And uh, of course, um, Preston closed just by presence, distracting QT Marshall for Colt Cabana to garner uh, some advantage. We've had some uh, solo Colt Cabana with the uh, apple in the corner and of course some flip-flop fly. He didn't do the Superman at all. But things really picked up at the end when uh, Stu Grayson basically with a run-up fall-through knee strike that dropped to where he stood behind the rest back. Again, the numbers, the Dark Order, they have the numbers game. Uh, it played in favor as Colt Cabana, he was basically told to finally finish this with the discus clothesline, the special Mr. Broly, and Colt Cabana got the win for himself and the Dark Order. Dark Order seemed very happy with this. Even Luna seemed very happy with this. Ali seemed a little annoyed by this. Don't blame her. I'm not sure where we go uh, from here. And uh, the match had a pretty good time. As again, QT Marshall, one of the trainers of the Nightmare Factory, they got a good about uh, nine minutes. So, again, we look further now as Colt Cabana really tries to figure himself out to do better by his career, but also apparently 
learn the way of the Dark Order and embrace it. Now, will he? I don't know. I mean, he's wearing the black fur, but he still has that classical Cabana theme, and he still seems reluctant. But hey, he got the win, and he still is getting wins since joining the Dark Order, as far as singles actions go. But I still think he's on thin ice with Mr. Brody Lee. I don't know what he's got to do to get some forgiveness from that guy. Moving on from there, we go into a... This was the number one match I was looking forward to this entire show. This is what AEW Dark's been built around. It finally was supposed to end here. As Brandon Cutler and Peter Avalon probably put on my favorite match to date, singles-wise, on AEW Dark. As both men pulled out everything on each other. So many near falls here during this time. But again, there was two ways I saw this ending. Brandon Cutler was either winning or this was going to continue. And I got the freaking second. Double count out. After eight minutes of intense action, both men knock each other to the floor, leave the base, is looking on, don't know what to do at this point. Literally stopping Peter Avalon, by the way, from uh, using a book, and that almost cost him too. I believe it's gotta be the sign factor of this. Come on now. Or Oliva, you need to remediate this and mend this back again into the initiative. And I'll get a sure if you do that too. <clears throat> In the end, though, after eight minutes, near nine minutes of insane action, both men couldn't believe it. This thing still continues. They both are winless. Double count out. What? What do we got to do to find somebody to get their first win here? Does Leva Bates need to be a special guest referee? Do we need to eliminate no count out? Should it be a no DQ match at this point? What do we need to do? Part of me is happy, but part of me wants to see this end too. Because when I think about these two on Dynamite, really trying to push beyond that idea of enhancement talent, as Peter Avalon classified himself as, but I believe he's more than that. One of these two need to get a win. And I really thought it was going to end here. I was wrong, but I'm kind of okay with it. I'm really enjoying this storyline. I don't know about you. Leva, good luck. That's all I got to say to you every week, my friend. <clears throat> Such a fun personality, too. Moving on from there, our semi-main event, it featured the best friends as they took on Max Stardom and Dante Smiley. And the best friends came in here with a lot of pent-up aggression as they really looked forward and prepared for their parking lot fight. Uh, in the end, it was a pile driver by Trent that got the win uh, for his team. As the best friends pretty much uh, dominated most of this, and Trent's the strongest headband in the game with the uh, assisted spear on the outside. Seemed like he put more speed in that spear than I've seen in uh, others. So definitely driven by getting some redemption for his mama, Sue. Uh, good match overall. Strong showing by everybody on this independent showcase. As that's what Dark is. It gives a chance for independent talent to really shine. It would not surprise me if a number of these talents been trained in that Nightmare Family or Factory or my even given role in what's soon to be uh, Dustin Rhodes at wrestling school. Congratulations, by the way, to Dustin. Finally starting that. Well deserved. Five decades. Earned. Everything. Timeless legend. One of my all-time favorites. Nothing but respect for the guy. Honored to have met him in January. And then we go into our main event as we have the Dark Order. And basically, it was Evil Uno and Stu Grayson taking on Private Party and Austin and Billy Gunn. Oh, by the way, my bad. This was an eight-man match. No wonder this was the longest match tonight and was wild and went over 14 minutes. As it was three and four in Evil Uno and Stu Grayson versus Private Party and Austin and Billy Gunn. Great back and forth, fast tag team tandem offense by all four teams involved in here. Many near fall spots. At one point, Private Party was taken out by the Dark Order. And literally, it came down to Austin and Billy Gunn, Austin being the legal guy, and Austin falling to fatality. As it looked like Stu Grayson was about to pick up the win earlier in the match, but of course, that was broken up. But when it comes to fatality, that is a finish. And the Dark Order stood tall at the end. So a good night for the Dark Order overall. Andre J not intimidated. And two wins for the Dark Order. I'm sure Mr. Broy Lee was very happy. It surprises me we haven't had like a little type skit, like a performance review or like really looking at the Dark Order by the numbers and seeing Mr. Broy Lee like maybe rank his uh, Dark Order recruits based on, you know, their action and stuff. And I wonder if he's going to fire anybody from the Dark Order and replace some people. It feels like to me that John Silver is on thin ice every time I watch BTE. But then again, as this is like an office skit replica, honestly, I say you don't change the Dark Order, keep it the way it is. But honestly, right now, Anna Jay, it's Duke Grayson. That's what I look forward to now in the Dark Order. And Mr. Broly saying, fuck! But I digress. Okay, so that was last week's AEW Dark. Let's just go ahead and briefly run down this week's episode of AEW Dark. As again, you think they're going to rest? Nope. We have another 11-match showcase. Good God almighty, how the hell am I going to keep up with all this professional wrestling? So first off, we have Ricky Starts with Christopher Daniels. If Ricky Starts gets a win over the veteran Christopher Daniels, that would be huge 
for him and his career. Biggest win today, Christopher Daniels, tested man, way up there, still has a ton to give, always shows off in singles action, has pretty good singles matches on uh, AEW as far as outcome goes. But of course, we got to build towards the war that we're going to talk about shortly. So I'm going to say we can start against this one by hook or by crook. We then have tag action with the Dark Order as 5 and 10. Take on Risen and Xander Go. I think that's pretty obvious, folks. We're going to see Dark Order get a win here. And Alan Angels might finally get his first win. It's amazing what sort of talent they've signed that really have gotten wins out here. We then have the Lucha Brothers with Eddie Kingston in the corner. Taking on Dante Smile and Max Stardom. The Lucha Brothers were on thin ice with each other at one point after losing the Jurassic Express. Eddie Kingston remended and remediated that. You're my brother. I love you. You're my friend. You're both brothers. Brothers fight, but brothers make up and stick together. Well, this match is going to prove that because I have no doubt the Lucha Brothers are going to win this. Eddie Kingston, speaking of which, real talk, takes on Brian Pillman Jr. And with that ridiculous spinning back form strike, there's no doubt in my mind he's going to win this, but this is going to be a great, great match. Eddie Kings is one of those that doesn't really like put himself on a pedestal. He's out there for the folks in the business that have been there up and down the roads with him or the same like him. Real talk, real heart, real wrestler, real man. I expect it's a really good match here. Brian Pillman should sure have a hell of a showing. And sir, Eddie Kings is going to come out by himself too and really test this young man to his limits. But yeah, I got to go with Eddie Kings then. This one super excites me, as Kylan King, one who I truly believe should be signed by AEW, has fairly impressed me. She takes on newly signed Serena Deeb. Congratulations to Serena Deeb. Again, if you want my thoughts on that, go look at my uh, simply and react in the video, but I'll just say this. This is one of the best things that could happen in AEW women's division to not only further enhance the way the talent works in the ring, but also outside too, as she's done it all. Coaching, wrestling, you name it. She's driven, she loves this. And it's going to be awesome what she brings to AEW's division. And it starts with this match in Dark Now, it seems, for Kylan King. This is sure to be Kylan King's toughest showing, but it's also going to be her strongest, I believe. Because, again, each match, Kylan King continues to impress me. So, with that being said, I'm kind of torn on this, but i got to go with the veteran here. I'm going to say Sarita Deeb gets the win. But Kylan King never stopped fighting. Moving on from there, finally, this is one of those guys that's been there on Dark forever since this COVID era began. It finally might be his time with everything he's given AEW, including being part of a campaign now broken. Let's give this man his first win as Lee Johnson takes on the recent coming Ben Carter. Ben Carter, well-known wrestler from the UK scene. I'm sure my friend Meg Chiba could tell me more about that. Please follow her at Meg Chiba on Twitter and read her articles too, giving you a weekly five best and worst moments of WWE. Always a fun read. But with that being said, I'm going to go with Lee Johnson here, uh, picking up the win. And following that, we have Mr. Willpower himself, Reese the Sign Will Hobbs, taking on Serpentico. Serpentico has been very effective when it comes to being a tag team with Lubra, but this is singles action. Singles action has not benefited him, and I sense that Willpower is going to stampede over this guy and get the win. We then have the Dark Order. As Evil Uno and Stu Grayson, they take on Remnant Lewis and Fuego Del So Once again, proving why they should be in contention for the AEW Tag Team Championships in the near future. I got to go with the Dark Order. Join the Dark Order. And going from there, we then have George Nell and Sonny Kiss taking on Kevin Blackwood and Daniel Garcia in their tag team uh, debut. George Nell and Sonny Kiss, very effective, odd duo as a tag team, but when it comes to that top rope split leg drop, it's pretty much over, and I think that's one that's going to give them the win. Considering George Nell and Sonny Kiss are coming off a loss from La Trapignan and Brick Wall, Jake Hager. Then we have more tag team action as M. Badul and Cruz take on the Gun Club in Austin and Billy Gunn. Would not surprise me if they're thirds watching from afar. But after their uh, loss in the eight-man tag with the Dark Order, I'm going to say that the Gun Club gets the win here off maybe a famous sir by Billy. And then we have one of my favorite teams in AEW, the Butcher and the Blade, taking on Calvin Stewart and Puff. And I have no idea who Puff is. I've heard a little bit about Calvin Stewart. If you want to know more about these independent wrestlers, I encourage you to follow IW um, TV, independent uh, wrestling uh, television network. It's like a app service. There's also Powerbomb. Um, also, many of these people, I'm sure my good friend Cindy can tell you. So if you want to know more about independent wrestlers and wrestling, ask her about these names. Follow my friend on Twitter at C underscore OK. And support my wrestling posts, because that's the heart of this as us fans of professional wrestling. I wish I knew more about these people personally, but it's always nice to hear when Taz and Excalibur actually give me insight versus fun humor about themselves. It's a nice balance there, but I always want to learn more about the wrestlers personally. But regarding this, full depth, simple as that, Butcher and Blade gets the win. And that will be our AEW Dark this coming week. But we're not done there, folks, because tomorrow night, for the first time, following the NBA playoffs as soon as they're over, right now being queued for 10 p.m., we will have a special one-hour edition 
of AEW Dynamite, simply called Late Night Dynamite. And it will feature commentary by Le Champion, Chris Jericho, and three matches. And I'm really looking forward to this. So our first match is Matt Seidel, who you all saw from the Casino Battle Royale. He takes on the chairman, Sean Spears, with Tully Blanchard. Now, Tully Blanchard, when we got FTR in their corner, we've seen how effective Tully Blanchard is when it comes to FTR, but we've also seen how effective that glove is that Tully gave Sean Spears, that so-called for protection, and how much that helps in the match, too. Even though it doesn't really come in play in the match, I've noticed, but it definitely is a statement afterwards. Matt Seidel, though, is nobody to just take likely as a former X Division champion, and I feel it's going to really bring a fight here, but he better have his third eye open, or I think he's going to be knocked out. But I sense the C4 or the DVD, whichever he goes with, I sense Sean Spears, will get the win. This will be these two first ever single encounter to my knowledge. Moving on from there, we then have a hell of a match. As Scorpio, Scott, 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 he takes on Ben Carter. Ben Carter, one of the most world renowned wrestlers, again, the UK scene, but Scorpio Scott, you know he's driven to really show why he can be a top tier singles professional wrestler, top star in AEW. And of course, coming off the loss from the TNT title with Cody, but of course that eight man win over the dark quarter, yeah, you guys said Scorpio Sky's now trying to build some singles momentum. And this isn't on Dark either, and he wants to go beyond Dark. So this is his chance now to uh, really get things back in his favor. Coming off what uh, Kazarian did uh, last week and what Christopher Dallas is going to do on Dark, Scorpio Sky, I'm sure, is going to try and outdo what both of them are going to do. So with that being said, I am going with Scorpio Sky for the victory. And then it would not surprise me this is the opener, though. But then again... Maybe if you get in the time, it will be. And maybe the angle, because think about the angle, because we don't know where Ty stands. We then have the Queen Slayer, number 99, on a JF, the Dark Order, taking on Brandy, Brandy Rhodes. Finally, all she wanted was a one on one match. Fight me. Well, now we're going to get it. So here's the way I see this going I sense Dustin will be in Brandy's corner, and only Dustin. I sense Anna J will have the Dark Order just escort her and then go straight to the back because when it comes down to J, she gets the business done on her own, period. But there is Stu Grayson, and I'm sure Stu Grayson will be watching from afar, but then again, Stu Grayson won't need to restrain her like he had to add all out. Uh, with that being said, though, Anna J just going past one year in her professional rest career. Congratulations to her. Uh, Brandy Rose, I know she's trying to help the AEW women's division, but also want to prove why she is a great wrestler as well. I personally, and this is just me personally, I want to see Brandy Slade. So I'm going with Bonna J personally for the win. May she put her to sleep for good. And maybe they'll write Brandy off uh, TV for a while and we further this idea of the dominance of the Dark Order over at the Nightmare Family, where both of them return and challenge the Dark Order in some uh, odd way. There's got to be something big coming down to the Dark Order versus the entire Nightmare Family when they clash. Because you know Cody and Arn, they're going to return with vengeance. And I don't think it's going to happen at all out, even though Anna J is on the banner for all out. But I could definitely see this turning into something as big as the Stam Stampede. Might be like a war in a double cage. Just saying. Or a lights out type of venue, you know, because Dark Order has all the cards and Mr. Burley. But I digress. Anyway, so that's what I have to say regarding that. Now let's go ahead and talk about AEW Dynamite, because that's why we're here. Because always, AEW Dynamite, it brings us full of excitement. So last week's show was one of the best Dynamites I've seen in a while, personally, and honestly felt like pay-per-view caliber television. As last week, we started off with FTR taking on Jurassic Express, or so we thought, because as Jurassic Express were out in the ring, who comes out but the Young Bucks to just double super kick a referee, wearing brand new shirts, by the way, and a whole new attitude, it seems. And then they just walk away, and it's like, well, that's probably another $10,000 fine, $5,000 each. But they suddenly just see Tony Khan. Hey, Tony Khan appears backstage. And Buck say, you want to find us? Pulls out water money, throws on Tony Khan's lap, and they walk away. According to BT today, though, they have been finding another $10,000. So I wonder if they're going to do the same thing, where they're going to double super kick now, how they're going to set their presence. Will we learn why? And where does Kenny Omega's head stand? Anyway, as we move on from that angle about what's going on in the elite, is the elite fine? I don't know, Carol. Uh, we go into an awesome tag team match as Jurassic Express, once again, they always continue to impress. But Jungle Boy here was definitely the uh, star of this match. My God, the 
endurance this guy went through and the spots that this guy tried to get the win out of. FTR and Jurassic Express is a really good competitive opener. Luchasaurus was taken out after again. He went flying and was basically extinct. And it came down to uh, Jungle Boy in a 2-1 handicap match, but FTR, they controlled him in the corner and basically outside the rest view. Totally and the assistance of the other member FTR, they all three worked together to get the pinfall win over Jurassic Express. So that's probably going to hurt Jurassic Express in the rankings. And FTR, again, they bring their style of wrestling to the AEW division. And but totally on their side, you got a very effective, dangerous team and trio on hand. Totally with the manager and the uh, expertise experience and FTR with their all-round tag team wrestling uh, dynamics and background. It's going to be interesting to see what it's going to take and who is it going to take to defraud these guys. Honestly, FTR, they might go further than Omega and Page because they are a legitimate tag team. And they are unlike any other team in AEW. Just saying. So I'm very curious to see uh, what happens uh, from there. All right. As we move on from there, we go into everyone's favorite. Because he's better than you. And you know it. MJF. MJF was in action, if you can call it that. Literally with the biggest ring bearer out there at ringside. And literally he destroys his opponent in a matter of seconds with the Salt of the Earth armbar. Almost as quick, probably, as when uh, Hikaru Shida took out Red Velvet ahead of her face, but LB4 for the AW Women's Championship. And basically, he sends out a statement here talking about maybe with the way the environment is here, I need to recruit some people, build my own faction. If you're all familiar with MLW, you might know where I'm going with this. But then again, whether he leaves, comes, goes, and they stay, it doesn't matter because at the end of the day, I'm going to prove why I am the undisputed uncrowned, undefeated future AEW World Champion. And apparently now he has some sort of moniker type announcement intro he wants Justin Roberts to say every week he comes out in regards to that. So get ready, folks, because you thought MJF was overbearing before. You ain't seen nothing yet. And I can only imagine what's going from Wardlow's mind as again. I can sense how much Wardlow just probably wants to knock MJF's head off. Just saying. Anyway, moving on from there, we go find Miro training with uh, Kip Sabian, Penelope Ford, and he's just getting jacked. Both of them are basically uh, training. At this point, Miro's like, you say ring, you say fight. I'm ready to get in the ring. I'm ready to fight. I, I can't wait to see Miro in his in-ring debut. But uh, in the end, he also, once again, knows why. I know, I know. Because, again, you picked me because I am the best man. And the best man has the best bachelor party planned. So stay tuned for that. I'm sure that's going to be a wild segment. And, of course, I'm sure it's going to be exercised with social distancing. But, again, we'll see. Uh, moving on from there, we go into a really great competitive singles match. My gosh. As Kenny Omega was on commentary, as Hangman and Page took on Christopher Kazarian. And both these two gave us an absolute clinic. It looked like at one point that Kassan was going to get the win off of a powerbomb uh, combination. And these two men, they traded Lariato for Lariato. But again, in the end, Adam Page, he did show incredible endurance. He pulled himself together, pulled out the buckshot lariat, and he did get the win as Kenny Omega watched on. As the win happened, though, Kenny Omega, he just walks away to the back. Very uh, reluctant, it seems. Like, yeah, I think we have a good singles win. So we don't really know where Kenny Omega's mind stands as he watches this on. But you could tell that Paige, he wanted to basically try and uh, mend bridges with Omega, and it doesn't look like that's happening for now. Great singles win for uh, him and that Paige. We'll see when K Omega, whenever he comes back in action, we'll see uh, what he brings and if he uh, can bring the same. And as far as Kazarian goes, Kazarian continues to impress as a single star, but I know he has tag team gold apparitions in his uh, future. And Scorpio's guy seems to be the only one pursuing a singles career. But then we also have Christopher Daniels, who's been doing a lot in singles on Dark. We'll have to see what really goes on for all three of these men individually. Because honestly, everybody in SCU right now, they're kind of writing their own story. And I don't know whether it's a good one right now or a bad one. My heart goes out to Kazarian because, again, that guy is a top ballot AEW champion waiting to happen, man. I'm surprised he didn't challenge up for the TNT title. And I hope he does soon. Incredible effort, incredible match. If you all watch one match from this week, keyword match, that'd be the one to watch. Moving on from there, Eddie Kingston comes out, and he basically says he has three points to make. One, he was never eliminated. He never went over the top rope. Go look at the tape. Well, we looked at the tape. Now go tell Lance Archer and inject that, because right now nothing's changing. 
But it would not surprise me because of that that Eddie Kingston does eventually get an AEW world title shot. Because, again, AEW, they're not all about controversy. But, again, Eddie Kingston going to keep running that on the ground. Then we also get to we are a united unit. We are a family. And as a family, we have our little bonding time. So what they do, they take some independent wrestlers out of the audience and literally beat them around in the ring. And then three, they said that it's time that we really bring Faith back together, especially for you, Blade. You need to go take care of QT and get your little bunny back. Well, I knew this was a silly tease, but it looks like we're getting a QT versus Blade program. Uh, unless it's the Natural Nightmares versus uh, Butcher and Blade, which may click from uh, Allie. Hey, Allie. The only thing I'm concerned about this is that I hope this doesn't stop Allie from wrestling, okay? Because I see her much more than a uh, valet. And she's had some great recent singles wins on Dark. And I see huge potential in her. But I guess we'll have to uh, wait and see. Because right now, since Allie's not really being involved in the whole Dark Order and uh, Nightmare Family type of feuding, it seems, because she has yet to be attacked, dare on a Jay to attack her. That'd be a good program actually big good match too uh, i don't know what's next for uh ali so again aw takes you in different directions so we'll see what happens with that following that we have tag team action as la Chavion, chris jericho and jake hager they took on private party and basically private party they were out here to get some retribution for matt hardy who was attacked earlier on the show backstage we don't know really necessarily how but i think we all subtly know because who comes up after Proud Party sees Matt Hardy laid out, but Chris Jericho holding Floyd the baseball bat. Again, the sixth member of the inner circle. You always need to consider that, okay? Just saying. Uh, very good competitive uh, tag team bout, and uh, in the end, Chris Jericho, he gets the win here with the Judas are fucked. And once again, these two prove their uh, dominance and prove why they are and want to be the future AW tag team champions. Very curious, different directions, it seems, going right now in the AEW tag team division. And again, Private Party eh, just can't seem to catch a break. Tough break. They came really close as Chris Jericho locked the walls in afterwards and then literally got Pele kicked by one of them. I sense a singles feud. I sense that Private Party and Inner Circle aren't done with each other yet, too. Just saying. Moving on uh, from there, we go into a bit of a set up for next week as we will have a huge six man tag team match where John Moxie and Lance Archer respect the sides. They will each pick two partners. And we learned who the two partners of Lance Archer was as he came out to the ring. It was Team Taz. And basically the proposal is this. After Lance Archer beats John Moxley for the AEW World Championship, he will give the first shot to the machine Brian Cage for the title. So we got a murder hawk, we got a killer, and we got assassins. So what does John Moxley have? Huge John Moxley up in the stands about to tell us who he's going to have. But who comes out and attacks him in the stands, masked, and yeah, I have no idea. It was Brian Cage and Ricky Starks basically attacking the champ, getting the better of him. But who comes to John Moxley's aid? Will Hobbs. As he says, the most dangerous man straight out of Oklahoma. This is one of my partners, Will Hobbs. And I think we all knew at least one person that John Moxley was going to team up with as he calls out for one particular relentless person. Darby on, get your ass down to Jacksonville because next week we are going to war. So there you go, folks. There's your main event for next week as we have Darby Allen, John Moxley, and Will Hobbs taking on Lance Archer and uh, Ricky Starks and Brian Cage. Should be a very interesting contested bout. Now, before we go into the actual close of the show, allow me to talk about also the great women's match we had, as well as the historic title match, as we had Fanda Rosa defending the NWA Women's World Championship against. Ivelisse. These two brought a very aggressive fight to each other, almost like a shoot, apparently, according to what I read, where it seemed like Ivelisse wasn't selling what Funda Rosa was bringing, which kind of hurt the identity of the title because you're showing that the champion is not that strong, according to what I'm seeing here. And again, you need to protect, you need to defend that legacy and, and protect that. Uh, with so, it, it was an odd situation, personally, uh, for me to watch that. Anyway, <clears throat> I thought it was a really good match. And in the end, of course, Funda Rosa should get win with the uh, Rosa with the uh, Funda driver. But then Diamete also attacks her from behind. It's a two one assault. But who comes out and basically helps Funda Rosa during this? Hikaru Shida. Hikaru Shida comes out uh, for the save here and basically looks at the NWA Women's title and then just hands it back to Funda Rosa. Champion respects champion. Game respects game. 
which sets up what I thought what I wanted to see, and it did. During this time, I, we are going to have a huge women's tag team match, champions versus champions, as Funda Rosa and Shikara Shida, they take on the duo of Eva Lise and Diamante. And that will also be next week on AEW Dynamite. Some wild action to come. But you want to talk about wild. You want to talk about pay-per-view caliber television. Look no further than the absolutely insane, bloody, brutal parking lot fight. Not a street fight, not a parking lot brawl, but just a parking lot fight. Circle of cars, fans galore, and wrestlers, of course, social distance. And we see Satana Ortiz come in like something out of a GLD remake for guerrilla warfare, it seems. Basically take on the best friends and nothing was left basically at that parking lot untouched. Multiple buys went through underneath car hoods. They went over freaking hoods. Glass everywhere in people's backs. People were powerbombed, slammed, sent on, freaking dropped on the vehicles. Vehicles were shattered, basically, as far as their roofs goes. They were uh, concave. We had steel pipe. We've had change. We had that retractable baton. We've had trash buckets. We've had freaking wet floor signs. And, of course, unforgiving concrete. And, basically, this was just an all-out physical war. And at one point, it looked like Pound Powerful were about to finish off the best friends after basically powerbombing Trent onto, basically, through a windshield of a vehicle. And he literally slowly just turns over and you just see shards of glass in his back and just blood everywhere. He was cut open like a ham. God. And literally, big old steel pipe was about to end things here as Chucky was just up against a car. But apparently, they had a secret weapon. All at the push of a button. As a hood opened up of the car that he was at and he was in it. Freshly squeezed, Orange Cassidy with a wrapped up fist of chain and pulls off the orange crust of mint punch of one member of Proud and Powerful. And then that member of Proud and Powerful is basically taken out with freaking pile driver by uh, Chucky. But the match ends emphatically when Trent pulls off the crushy, crunchy, I think, on, who was it? Uh, Ortiz, I think, through plywood on the back of a freaking Ford pickup truck through the plywood Head first into the bed of the truck. One, two, three. This physical war is over. The best friends won. Holy freaking cow. What an amazing, amazing fight. Not match. Fight. This legitimately was a real type fight pay-per-view caliber ending to a feud. I absolutely loved it. My favorite match of the entire week. And literally, it's been uh, praised highly by Kings of Hardcore himself, including Bang Bang McFoley. When I think about this match, I don't think about seeing a match of this type of gimmick this good since Eddie Guerrero and John Cena. There, I said it. You know, back when uh, things were really fun and stuff like that. So, <clears throat> I must say, oh, how could I forget? Before we end Dynamite, there was one last thing. As again, they did for one person. Mama, as literally Trent's mom, Sue, you hear a horn beeping, she's got a new minivan. And basically, she picks up the boys. The boys, all three of them, get in the vehicle, uh, even with their bloody backs, because good lord, they were all screwed up. And literally, uh, Chuck just looks out and just goes, eh, eh. But as we ride off, we get one last statement from Sue. And I was wondering if she was going to say or come into play. The end, folks. Proud powerful, remember this. Don't mess with a man's mother or minivan. And then they drive off. That is one of the best endings I've ever seen. <laughs> on AEW Dynamite. Good Lord Almighty, what a wild, crazy, fantastic episode. Well, that was last week's Dynamite. Let's go ahead and briefly discuss this one. As again, we're trying to figure out what's next for the uh, Bachelor Party, whatever that means. We also have a wild six-man tag main event. I'm sure that's gonna be the main event. As we have <clears throat> John Moxley, Will Hobbs, and Darby Allen taking on the trio of Lance Archer, uh, the Machine, Brian Cage, and Absolute Ricky Starks. We also have hot women's action, and by hot I mean full of attitude, as we basically have what's coming up this week, Eva Lise and Diamete. They will take on the champion duo of Funda Rosa and Hikaru Shira. So let's go ahead and briefly talk about both these matches. 
when I think about the women's match, obviously I see Hikaru, the champions going over here. Now, would I love to see Funda Rosa versus Hikaru Shida again, maybe like for winner takes all? Absolutely. But I don't see them going in that direction as long as Funda Rosa keeps doing what she's doing with professional wrestling all over the world. Because people might not have heard of Excalibur, but she's also a champion in Japan. She's a triple champion, folks. With that being said, she's also defending nonstop the NWA Women's World Championship. And again, she will be defending the Women's World Championship against Priscilla Kelly tomorrow night, an NWA uh, primetime special that you can get on Fight TV. And I look forward to watching that. But Hiko Oshida, she needs an opponent for her next title bout, which you know is going to be probably full of gear. I think about maybe when she saved Ty Conti, and I wonder if they do an exhibition with Ty Conti and does that set up her versus Ana Jay with Ty Conti maybe in Ajay's corner and Ty Conti joins the Dark Order, which is still unconfirmed because she doesn't rush to decisions. Smart woman. I also think about the fact that Nyla Rose, I know she wants her title back, and Vicky Guerrero is going to do everything she can to influence that to happen, if nothing else, influence the championship match to happen. But I don't want this title to just be surrounded by two women. Then, of course, I also think about Ivelisse and Diamete. These two, they bring fire, they bring attitude, they bring great professional wrestling. Could you see maybe some sort of uh, multi-person type match for the AEW Women's World Championship? I'm not fully sure. But the bottom line is this. Thunder Rosa, hey, you guys want to attack her from behind? She's going to make you pay. And now she has someone in her corner in the AEW Women's World Champion. Hey, all right, let's do it. So we got a tag match. And I sense no matter what that uh, she's going to win. So there you go. And as far as the six-man goes, this one's tricky because we are literally counting down the days. Or if you follow Lance Archer on Instagram, he's counting down the days. And that's what actually did that for his uh, entrance. Like a countdown step from five to like 25 as uh, we're 24 days out. Uh, it's Lance Archer, Brian Cage, and Ricky Starks taking on Darby Allen, Will Hobbs, and the champion, John Moxley. Clearly, the champion and the challenger, they're going to be protected. I don't see either one of them involved in the decision because that would try and lead people to think, okay, this person won. Wrestling logic would dictate to me if this person's going to lose uh, this coming week. And I don't want to think like that. So let me see here. <clears throat> I look at Ricky Starks and Darby Allen. That was a one-on-one -on -one way to have it. They keep on just poking the bear. And Darby Allen, of course, hasn't been seen since that body bag tag filled throw spot in the casino battle royale. And it would not surprise me if he tries to use a tag covered skateboard again on Ricky Starks. Maybe he just on Brian Cage this time. Then I think about Will Hobbs and Brian Cage and their subtle, um, what can I say, introduction to each other in the casino battle royale. That's a big one-on-one -on -one match waiting to happen too. So when I look at this match, I think about the other feuds involved, but who do you want going in with more momentum in the upcoming anniversary AEW World Championship match between Lance Archer and John Moxley? John Moxley, PWI's 500 number one rest of the year, virtually unstoppable, it seems, says you have to kill him, basically. Okay? If we're going to enforce that idea, then Lance Archer needs to enforce some damage or a strong example while John Moxley's there. So it feels like to me that Lance Archer and his team, they kind of have to get the win. And I guess we haven't seen Lance Archer mess around with Darby Allen, but I can see Ricky Starks also picking up by heelish antics. So I'm going to go if Ricky Starks gets the uh, better of Darby Allen in this case here under multi-person uh, wrestling rules. And uh, we'll see how that builds towards the feud. It should be a wild six-man tag, though. And again, this six-man tag is proven the anniversary show, so it makes me wonder if we are going to get Ricky Starks versus uh, Darby Allen on the anniversary show, or are we going to get uh, Will Haas versus Brian Cage for even the FTW title on the anniversary show. A lot to think about. Also, Chris Jericho, La Champion, he will be appearing as well. Now, what he'll be doing or saying, who freaking knows? Maybe Matt Hardy will confront him via Titan Tron. Because again, Matt Hardy, I thought he's supposed to get better. Okay. And that just leads me to talk about this last match. As I guess because we don't know what's going on here. And he has been very effective and dominant in his singles run. Mr. Brody Lee will now defend his TNT championship against freshly squeezed Orange Cassidy. Well, we just went from the Nightmare Freddy versus Dark Order to the Best Friends versus the Dark Order, in my opinion, because I sense all hell is going to break loose here. Because I don't know what Mr. Brody Lee is going to do to Orange Cassidy, nor do I know what Orange Cassidy is going to do to further infuriate Mr. Brody Lee, where we might literally audibly hear some F-bombs dropped. But we all know that, well, you know if you follow Orange Cassidy on the independent scene, he's no stranger to taking on people bigger than him. Let's be honest here. But I can't see 
Mr. Broy Lee losing the TNT title this soon. If you protect the integrity of the championships, you look at the longevity of the champions that had it. Nobody's been a flash in the pan so far with the women's title, the world title, the tag titles, and even the TNT title. And yes, the TNT title I know is the youngest as Mr. Broy Lee is literally their second champion. But there's a bigger story going on here, and you look at the story and you wonder what's the ending to that story. And it all might just go right back to Cody versus Mr. Brody Lee. I hope it doesn't go to that because I think that'll be too obvious. I want to be surprised. But with that being said, this match is going to be insane. Wild, I sense members of the Dark Order are going to get involved here. I sense the best friends are going to get involved here. And maybe even the Natural Nightmares or whatever's left in the Nightmare Family Collaboration is going to get involved here. And I'm just going to say that Mr. Brody Lee is going to hold on to this title one way or another. That's all I have to say about that. And with that being said, that's really all that's known right now for this upcoming episode of AEW Dynamite. So with that being said, let's go ahead and think about what's been going on. What will the Young Bucks do to either pay their fine or incur another fine? Will they finally talk about their actions? Where is Kenny Omega's head at? Are we going to get more into the cleaner maybe coming? Because he did say he, need, he may focus on a singles run. Are we going to see the elite the three, the top three, the key three, the elite, the, the elite, unite in some way prior to the anniversary show. Because I feel like that's the biggest thing away in the come. Then I can talk about that later. But honestly, I don't know at this point, And I'm just super curious. And then I think about what is next in the women's division. As Britt Baker is not 100% healed. Uh, Big Swell beat Britt Baker. She's number two. You think she would be challenging Hikaru Shida maybe at the anniversary show. Maybe they set up something like that uh, out of nowhere. Uh, what's Fundo Rosa's next plans for uh, AEW? How does Serena Deeb help shape this women's division? When Shauna coming? Because apparently Shauna, who's been stuck in the UK due to uh, travel restrictions, she might be back literally within a month, and I feel she'd be a very strong uh, ballot contender for the AEW Women's Championship. As again, she fairly impresses me, and I feel like it's time we uh, go back to uh, building those uh, stars. And I'm sorry, wrestlers. Apologies, folks. And then I wonder, Chris Statlander, how's she going to come back into play here? Are they going to start up in a program maybe with Abaddon? Maybe that's when Abaddon and Chris Statlander both come together on Dynamite and we get a darker side of Chris because I know she wanted to do like a darker alien type thing. There's so many things I wonder about the women's division, you know? But honestly, I can ramble on all night. I don't have any questions to answer and I can't really think of anything else at this point that's happening on Dynamite as I look through my phone. So I think we're done here. So thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, for tuning in to this simple discussion, preview, review, predictions, and everything else in between about all things All League Wrestling here on AEW Spark. I appreciate your viewership, and I'd love to hear your questions, your feedback, any questions you might have, anyone you think that should be involved in AEW, to go to AEW, what do you want to see from AEW, any thoughts you have about AEW, good or bad, challenge them. I don't care. Come on. Just be open with me. That's all AEW should be. AEW is unrestricted after all, at least the podcast is. Be open about how you feel about it. Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. You want to know more about me, though? Know this. I'm just a simple man and a lifelong fan of dot, dot, dot wrestling. So follow me, Twitter, Instagram, PlayStation, and in Foster 1916. Follow the Civil YouTube channel here at youtube.com forward slash into forward slash no foster 210 for all things wrestling. Shout out to MHW family on Twitter. I'll be back again with uh, Simple Take Fall on G1 Climax uh, action and our live Simple Chat, of course, uh, later in the week. Other content to come as I literally am a little a month away from my second year anniversary as a YouTuber. It's been a lot of fun. I hope you all enjoyed the journey. I hope you all continue with me too. May I encourage you to just be yourself and have fun. Build a little spot for yourself here on YouTube and uh, see who you connect with too. As always, support my wrestling. Again, folks, that's the heart of this. And that's the heart of me as a wrestling fan. And as always, you want to know what I'm about, it's in the description down below. Support WrestleJoy, support NoDQ, support Pro Wrestling Discussions, Team All League, support Jeff Meacham Network, Greg Cherry Brand. Support one another. Let's support each other. And as always, I'd like to close. Support wrestling outlets, moving and small. Let's keep growing. This incredible, diverse, unique, elite, authentic, unscripted, unrestricted wrestling community together. Simple as that. With that being said, thank you so much for tuning in. Please like, share, subscribe, comment, tell a friend, hit the bell, and all the next video on this channel. Hit the subscribe button, help me keep growing on this channel. Shout out to Almond61 because that's been with me on this fun YouTuber creator's journey. And until next time, I just hope you all take care, enjoy life. Tomorrow's never guaranteed. Treasure your families. Enjoy wrestling. There's more of it now than ever. Find some promotion, somebody, maybe a friend or an enemy that can connect with you. And until the next video, just please wear a mask. We'll get through this together. Wash your hands, exercise, caution, safety every day. Don't live in fear. Do what you can to build yourself better each day, spiritually, mentally, and physically. 
And I just hope you all just keep being positive in life and have a good night. And if you can, enjoy both nights of AEW Dynamite. Bye, everybody.